In 1977, Nicky Lauda took his second World Championship title with Ferrari, but the road to that title was a very difficult one, even legendary. To explain what happened, we first have to look back to the previous 1976 season. He and his Ferrari were dominating the championship. Yes, Nicky Lauda was dominating 1976 until his accident at the old Nürburgring. After a first lap that saw all but mass on wet tyres, the whole field changed to slicks. Lauda was behind a group of slower cars when he left the pits after his tyre change and was making up for time lost when he went off the track, puncturing the Ferrari's fuel tank. Brett Lunger was unable to avoid the flaming wreck but he was unhurt and joined with other drivers to rescue Lauda. I lost my helmet and I was uh, unconscious in the car for about 55 seconds with 800 degrees of fire around me and uh, three of my colleagues pulled me out of the car. Enzo Ferrari could not believe Nicky Lauda was able to make a comeback in 1976, so he decided to hire Carlos Reutemann for his vacant seat. Nicky Lauda was not comfortable with this move, and he felt he had been let down by Ferrari. While Lauda was in hospital, James Hunt managed to win races and close the gap to Lauda in the championship. Because of this, Lauda decided to make an early comeback at Monza, only six weeks after his near-fatal accident. I remember very well going down to Monza to my first race. And uh, on the Friday, first practice, I went out of the pits and uh, I changed into second gear and I couldn't drive it. I was so frightened and I, tell you, I nearly shitted in my pants because I was so frightened of um, driving these cars because all the, ra all the accident came back. top six split into three fighting pairs. Peterson versus Depaye, Lafitte versus Regazzoni, and Schechter versus Lauda. At the flag, three seconds covered the first three cars. But it was the fourth finisher that captured the imagination. Nicky Lauda's fight back from the burns that had led to him being given the last rights in Germany was a magnificent example of determination and heroism. The reception he received from the crowd and the track workers showed the respect in which he was held. The last race at Fuji in Japan would decide who would win the championship, Nicky Lauda or James Hunt. At the end of the second lap, Lauda surprised everyone as he pulled into his pit and got out of the car. The conditions, he said, are suicidal. I can see nothing at all. 
There are more important things in life than the World Championship. Then he left the circuit to fly home. The rain was now beginning to decrease, but as the track was drying, the rain tires were beginning to wear. And then Hunt's front tire gave way under the strain. While he was in the pits, both Andretti and Depaye got past, leaving Hunt in third place. Hunt's desperate efforts to catch up were to no avail. The American had won, but the McLaren pits were only concerned with Hunt's third place. He arrived at his pit thinking he'd lost the title, and team manager Teddy Mayer and a group of pressmen had to convince him that he was actually third and therefore world champion. It was time for celebration, but the first thing Hunt needed was a drink and further confirmation that he really was champion. Nicky Lauda lost the title by only one point, but he would come back with a vengeance in 1977. For 1977, Nicky Lauda and Carlos Reutemann were given an upgraded version of the 1976 car, the 312T2B. The car was designed by Mauro Forgieri. Lauda always had a bit of a love-hate relationship with him, calling him an eccentric genius, but also a dictator. Now you will see a video clip in which Niki Lauda explains in detail his new car to the public. So, so here sits he also in the auto. Here am Lenker, da will noch einen kleinen Schalter, wo ich den Motor abstellen kann. Schalthebel, fünf Gänge, erste, zweite, dritte, vierte, fünfte in diesen Schlitzen hier, was sehr angenehm ist. Der Ferrari hat sicher eines der besten Getriebe. Pedale sind was sehr Wichtiges, wie in einem normalen Auto ist rechts das Gas, in der Mitte die Bremse, links die Kupplung. Auto hat drei Tanks, eines hier, einer hier und einer hinterm Sitz. Zwölf Zylindermotoren, man sieht hier auf jeder Seite die sechs Ansaugstutzen. PS-Zahl ungefähr 500, maximal Drehzahl 12.500. Ist das noch ein Auto oder ist es eine Bombe auf vier Rädern? Ich finde, es ist ein sehr schönes Rennauto, was seiner Funktion voll und ganz... The new Ferrari was powered by a 3 liter 12 cylinder engine in a 180 degrees angle, commonly known as a flat 12. Ferrari was using this engine since 1970. It was powerful and reliable. To give you an onboard impression, you will now be riding along in a 1975 spec Ferrari. A young Eddie Chivo was a test driver for Ferrari in 1977, and he had some nice things to say about the car. The Ferrari that Niki Lauda had tested in Monza was the most exciting Formula One car I ever drove. I went from a Formula Two car, which was kind of industrial compared to a, what a Ferrari F1 was at the time. It had a an H box gearbox where you could you almost couldn't make a mistake with the gears, and the brakes were incredible, and it fit like a custom-made shoe the, the engine would rev my goodness it must have revved 2000 revs more than anything i'd ever driven before and it was just I and mean, when you put a new set of tires on it was incredibly it was a, so well balanced ferrari's main competitors in 1977 were jody Schechter in the new wolf team
Mario Andretti in the Lotus 78, Formula 1's first true ground effect car. Patrick Depayet in the Tyrrell 6 wheeler. Jacques Lafitte in the Ligier Matra V12. And reigning world champion James Hunt in the McLaren. Before the new season started, Enzo Ferrari had a disappointing announcement for Niki Lauda. I came down to, to Ferrari again after one month and I said, now I'm ready, I'm full fit, uh, so let's start again to work. And then he said, oh, we want to start to work, but I have taken some different decisions now. Mr. Reutemann is the number one driver and you are the number two driver. Uh -huh. uh, my contract says I'm number one driver. Yeah, I know. I don't care. Reutemann, I'm 100% sure, he's the better one than you. You will not recover as quickly as you think. Therefore, he's the number one driver. It's the first change I'm doing. Reutemann is in charge now of the whole of development of the car. With the Ferrari management back in Carlos Reutemann, it was no surprise Carlos had an edge on Niki Lauda at the beginning of the season. Reutemann took Ferrari's first factory that year in Brazil. The Austrian was not at home here, and his best efforts were only good enough for 13th on the grid. The start was notable for Parchase dash along the pit wall. From the third row of the grid, he led the field through at the end of the first lap. He stayed ahead for seven laps, but then he collided with Hunt and had to pit for a new nose, ending his challenge. This left Hunt in the lead, but Reutemann was right behind him and pushing hard. So hard that the McLaren's front tyres began to go off, and he had to pit for a new one, resuming in fifth place and leaving Reutemann with a head to the lead. Hunt fought back up to second again, but he couldn't catch the Ferrari. The Italian team did well, but Lauda drove steadily from his lowly grid position to finish third. He was helped by a large number of retirement, and six cars finished. By Lauda's standards, it was not a good result. Niki Lauda was unhappy with the performance of the car, and he led an extensive test program to develop the car in his direction. Feeling more comfortable in the car, Lauda was able to take Ferrari's second victory at Kailami in South Africa. Hump led from the start and held first until on lap 7. Lauda beat him on breaking into Crowthorn Corner and took a lead that he was to keep. While other drivers like Nielsen suffered mechanical problems, the Ferrari never missed a beat. Tragedy struck the race on lap 22. Zorzi's shadow stopped opposite the pits and a marshal crossing the track with a fire extinguisher was struck and killed instantly by Price's car. The extinguisher struck Price's head, causing fatal injuries, but the car continued at full speed until it crashed at Crowthorn Corner, hitting the feet's Ligier in the process. The race continued, and although there was a natural reaction to a win among the Ferrari team members, 
There was a sombre atmosphere over the track as loud and loud as waited the podium to join Schechter and Depayne. At Hockenheim in Germany, Lauda took another victory. At the start, Schechter used his pole advantage to get ahead of Watson, while Lauda and Hunt fell in the third. Further back, the third was flying. Clay Regazzoni got the worst of it, just managing to stagger to the end of the pit wall on three wheels while trailing a shower of sparks. Coming through the stadium section for the first time, the order was Schechter, followed by Watson, Lauda and Hunt. In the McLaren pit, they were counting down to Rock and Mass for his tenth. On the track, Lauda had taken over second when Watson dropped out. After 13 laps, he passed Schechter for the lead. The South African tried his best, but the Ferrari's 12-cylinder had the advantage on the high-speed circuit and he had to be satisfied with something like As Lauda was greeted by his team and supporters, he had reason to be pleased. He was leading the world championship, but it was thanks to regular finishes in the points. He hadn't had a win since South Africa, seven races and almost five months ago. But now, he was back on the top step of the podium, the place he knew he belonged. Ferrari's last win of the season was at Zandvoort, and another win for Niki Lauda. Carlos Reutemann leads the cars lining up to head for the grid in Holland. The Argentinian was sixth fastest and would start behind Niki Lauda, who was fourth, just four hundredths of a second slower than James Hunt. Ahead of them was Jacques Lafitte, back on form again, and Marion Andretti, back on pole again. The start saw the feet lose out and Hunt come through, challenging Andretti and getting the vital inside line into the tires of the corner. Andretti lost ground and the feet too, in the first lap he was third. Mario was on form. Beschleunigungskraft aus den langsamen Kurven heraus. Andretti im Windschatten von Hunt. Und wieder ein Angriff von Andretti und Andrea. Ja, jetzt hat Andretti Glück gehabt. Wenn er das Rennen fortsetzen kann, dann war das wirklich Glück. Allerdings bei Hand ein möglicher Schaden jetzt an der Aufhängung. Sie sehen, dass der McLaren langsamer wird und ausrollt. Ja, das war eine unerwartete Es gehört zur Taktik eines Verfolgers in einem Grand Prix Rennen, den führenden Fahrer mit solchen Manövern zu irritieren, nervös zu machen, einmal rechts, einmal links in seinem Rückspiegel aufzutauchen. Und zwar so, dass ihn dann der schließliche Angriff möglichst unvorbereitet trifft. Lauter nur zwei Wagenlängen hinter dem Ligier Matra von Lafitte. Der auf der Geraden allerdings ein bisschen schneller ist. Lauter schiebt sich jetzt heran und führt, jawohl! Aus dem Windschatten heraus hat sich Niki Lauder angesaugt und ist an Lafitte vorbei. Niki Lauder damit in Sandford in Führung und das Ganze passierte in der 22. Runde. Lauder ist now leading. Keine Frage mehr, ob die Reifen ihre notwendige Betriebstemperatur auch erreichen, sondern viel eher die Frage, ob die Reifen auch halten. Und das ist der nächste Lotus-Ausfall. Gunnar Nilsson karamboliert mit Carlos Reutemann. But teammate Reutemann wasn't so lucky. He had been third, but just before the race's halfway point, he had to pit for attention to a damaged rear wheel. Ferrari designer Mauro Foglieri was looking anxious, and with cause. Lafitte had stuck to Lauda like blue, and now was the time for one last desperate effort. He didn't come off, however, 
and Lauda took the flag with the Frenchman just 1.89 seconds behind. This was only Lauda's third win of the season, but he'd scored points everywhere except in Sweden. After his win at Zandvoort, Nicky Lauda had a meeting with Enzo Ferrari, and he told Enzo his reasons why he wanted to leave the team. Ferrari called me to the factory and said, um, now let's sit down, discuss the future. And normally you do this with him alone, that he does not have to take a decision. But at that time, it was Fugheri there, De La Casa there, the money man. He was there, Gozzi was there, and I was sitting on the other side of the table and he says, how much do you want to continue our relationship? Because I just won the world championship. I said, nothing. What do you mean? No, I'm leaving. You're leaving? Are you crazy? How much do you want? I pay you any money you want. Sir, I have taken a decision. I'm going to drive for Eccleston, Braemar for mayor, unfortunately I signed a contract. This was the right decision for me at the time. I'm leaving. Then he was not happy. What did he do? He screamed around, he talked with his guys in Italy and forward and backwards, but then in the end, uh, there was nothing to do. And when I left this meeting, I will never forget this, I felt light as a feather. Because all this pressure I had, which you take every day and you don't realize, suddenly was gone. The Ferrari pressure to perform. And I felt completely happy, I have to say. Looking backwards, it was a big mistake. I should have stayed. I should have asked him the same amount of money what Bernie paid me. I would have been more successful. But at the time, it was for me the right decision, even if it was wrong. Because of all this experience after the accident, how difficult was it to get his support back? He put right the money in the car, made me a number two, then I won again the championship. So in all this, I, 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 I didn't want to forget. I had it in the back of my mind. But looking back, what it was wrong, to leave him. At the end, Nicky Lauda was winning the championship quite easily. The Ferrari 312 T2B was good enough to win the Drivers' and Constructors' Championship for Ferrari, but more thanks to the car's reliability than outright speed. Mario Andretti's Lotus was the fastest car in 1977, but his car was not reliable enough compared to the Ferrari, so he lost too many points to Lauda. Lauda decided to leave Ferrari after the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. For the final two races of the season, his seat was given to Gilles Villeneuve. In Canada, it was Gilles Villeneuve who made the headlines. The Canadian was Lauda's successor at Ferrari. In the following 1978 season, Ferrari would win races with both Reutemann and Villeneuve, but no championships, while Nicky Lauda would drive for Brabham Alfa Romeo. And Lauda's team boss at Brabham was going to be... Bernie Ecclestone. Well guys, if you like this kind of videos, please like and subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you all at my next Classic Formula 1 video. Thanks for watching.